uh, Karin Sackmann. She is a professor of history of technology at the Central Institute for the History of Technology and the Technical University of Munich. Uh, she is known internationally for her scholarship on engineering professions and technical education, history of consumption, gender history, and technologies of the Cold War. Her 2004 book on technology, gender, and the Cold War in the German Democratic Republic received the Deutsches Museum Award for Best Book in 2005. Her current research focuses on the industrialization of food, which we also just heard about. Um, and here today she asks, what shall we eat? Uh, in the sense of what is safe to eat, focusing on the issues of food safety and the problem of establishing adequate trust regimes with regards to food. So please, Professor Sackmann, the floor is yours. So thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction, also for the kind invitation. I'm very glad to be here. And I do have a PowerPoint presentation with a few pictures, but they are just an illustration, and I will read my paper just to have a little bit of water. So, what shall we eat? This is the question with many different meanings for humans in various societal and geographical contexts. The question, what shall we eat, arises in different contexts and steers up a range of emotions from despair over food shortages, well, a fear of food risk, the perplexity in the face of unmanageable variety when food supplies are plentiful through the release of event planners tasked uh, with choosing the perfect menu to send the right message. In my paper, I want to approach this question from two angles or two perspectives, a theoretical and a historical one. First, I will examine the scenario what, uh, that behind the question, what shall we eat, uh, is the more general problem, what is safe to eat. Um, I will examine how philosophers and sociologists reason the problem of food safety and explore how humans attempt to guarantee food safety by establishing adequate trust regimes. Here I will discuss the meaning and mechanisms of trust as a societal process subject to change. And this is something we explored some years ago together with Per Ostby uh, in a project that we had together on food technology and trust. Second, I argue that science and technology both reinforces and problematizes our trust in food. I will analyze how nation states at the turn of the 20th century set up the first science-based trust regime at the core of which was the nutrients paradigm. However, this paradigm was challenged in the 21st century within the life sciences, in particular molecular biology and genetics, by the new paradigm of molecularization employed in its research related to food. The transformation in our understanding of food and metabolism accompanying this paradigm shift has important ramifications for the science-based regimes of trust. Now let me turn to the problem of food safety and the meaning of trust. The problem of food safety is due to, is due to the dual significance of, both, of food as both a biological and a social-cultural fact. The philosopher Helmut Plesner explains this dual significance with his concept of human natural artificiality. Humans are biological generalist species in contrast to many animals that are specialist species and thus can only thrive on a very limited diet in a narrow range of environments. Due to their biological conditions as generalists, humans are capable of living in many vastly different environments. At the same time, however, human beings must creatively adapt to their chosen environment, in effect, 
producing the world in which they live because they have no natural place. Humans imbue the worlds they make with meaning establishing cultures. Through their agency, human beings transform their natural artificiality into a cultural existence. Food and what and how we live with it, define it, consume it, is one aspect of this existence. It follows that humans establish a broad variety of food ways. A French sociologist, Claude Fischler, also takes up the human lack of physical specialization as the point of departure for his concept of the omnivores paradox. Omnivores have the freedom of choice, but the constraint of variety. Humans, however, select their food not only according to physiological requirements, but also on the basis of cultural and social representation. But what is the missing link between the physical chemical structure of food, its sensation and representation? This is the principle of incorporation. And here I quote Fischler, the action, it is the action in which we send a food across the frontier between the world and the self, between outside and inside our body. We are what we eat, or in German, man isst was man isst. Um, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, contains both a biological and a cultural truths. Fischler explained this as follows. Because we are uh, omnivores, incorporation is an act laden with meaning. Because of the principle of incorporation, identification of food is a key element in the construction of our identity. Finally, because identity and identification are of both vital and symbolic importance, man has invented cuisine. Cuisines are the core element of food waste. They're definite forms of expression. Cuisine works as a way of transformation and of classification. Via selection, preparation and cooking, cuisine transforms nutritional raw materials from the state of nature into the state of culture. In doing so, we classify the world as we divide the universe into what is edible and what is not. So I have a less critical um, view on uh, the cuisines as has Rousseau. Whereas the forms of cuisines are manifold, the aim of cuisine is clear-cut. Cuisine labels, stamps, recognizes, and thus identifies the food and the eater. Thus, cuisine as a language of food, as Levi-Strauss has said, and as elementary communication, what we learned from Roland Barthes, contributes not only to the acceptability of certain fares, but also to the formation of communities. The bonds of cuisine generates the feeling of familiarity, safety, and trust. Cuisine thus creates a sense of belonging. Sharing a meal forms a community whose identity rests to a significant degree on the food that is eaten together. The relationship between food waste and identity exists on two levels. The first one is the identification of food in order to tame the potential danger of incorporation. The second level is the emergence of food habits, which secure the identification of food and simultaneously form the identity of the group which performs and preserves those habits respectively. Since the close of the 19th century, in particular since the post-World War I period, the identification of food gradually shifted from smaller regional or ethnic communities to the state, big business and science. This shift in responsibility resulted from a growing distance between the field and the fork, concomitant with the industrialization of the food system. State agencies, big business and science abandoned regional cultural traditions in favor of scientific knowledge and the appeal of efficient methods of mass production. Indeed, Reputatively, universal scientific knowledge and efficient methods of mass production became the norms of perceiving and processing food. The industrialization of food chains gained further momentum with the emergence of modern agribusiness, the blossoming of home economics and nutritional science, and the euphoria surrounding rationalization and efficiency. As soon as an increasing number of actors and institutions mediated between processing, pro uh, 
production, preservation, purchase, and consumption of food. The process of securing its trustworthiness and reliability had to change. But how do new forms of trust emerge? How has trust been built, lost, and regained in relation to food? To answer these questions, we must first grapple with the concept of trust in general before we can examine the specific attempts of modern societies to establish food trust. Now I turn to the workings of trust in modern and late modern society. First, trust starts from ignorance as it explicitly accepts a lack of knowledge. The truster assumes that his or her ignorance in a specific matter is not problematic and will not result in negative outcomes. In traditional societies, acceptance of ignorance is based on interpersonal confidence or on religion, trust in God. The need for trust expands with the growing complexity of modern societies where uncertainty increases as the accumulation of ever more knowledge is accompanied by an even faster growth of ignorance. At the same time, the conditions of modern societies erode the traditional basis for establishing relationships of trust as life worlds characterized by close, familiar, and personal relationships are replaced by the more abstract relationships of individuals to institutions and organizations. Anthony Giddens introduced the notion of disembeddedness for this process. Modern societies must generate new relationships of trust to cope with uncertainty. Institutions and organizations now become the objects of trust. Institutions facilitate the acceptance of uncertainty by providing a system of rules we rely on. For example, I can trust to buy wholesome fresh meat in the supermarket because of institutionalized food controls. Organizations unburden us from the need to prove the trustworthiness of food for ourselves by assuming these tasks. Um, for example, I can eat convenience food without fear of being poisoned by food additives because food additives must be proven safe for human consumption before being employed. Trust in institutions and rules involves what Anthony Giddens has called the belief in the rightness of expert systems. The replacement of personally mediated trust relations of, of traditional life worlds by trust in institutions and organizations, however, does not imply that the latter are no longer personally mediated. Indeed, trust can be directed toward institutions and organizations only via a human interface. And Giddens calls them points of access. Trust in system complements the trust in institutions and organizations, but it is a fundamentally different quality. Its task is not to replace uncertainty, but to compensate for disappointment when trust is betrayed. It aims to recompense for the damage caused by misplaced trust and to correct failures and thus to reestablish the basis for trust. For example, sellers of spoiled meat will be punished, loss of earnings because of illness due to food poisoning will be paid by health insurance. Thus, trust and system supports the other relationships of trust because the acceptance of uncertainty always includes the possibility of having trusted mistakenly. The need to generate new relationships of trust becomes more urgent in late modern societies. The need for trust increases with growing uncertainty. But it is more and more unclear where to direct this trust. Institutions lose their importance, organizations prove to be more and more short-lived, and communication takes place increasingly uh, through the media. Thus, our points of access, to borrow Giddens' terminology, grow ever more virtual and less personal. Do the foundations of trust still exist in late modern society? Are the food scares regularly recurring since the mid-1970s an indicator for the increasing difficulty of establishing trust relations? Do new conditions and structures emerge for overcoming uncertainty and insecurity? And if so, can we still speak of them in terms of trust? 
I would like now to turn to an exploration of how science and technology have both reinforced and problematized our trust in food. I will show how nation states mobilized scientific knowledge, experts and institutions in order to establish trust in modern uh, systems of food provision. But neither scientific knowledge nor institutions provide a resilient basis for establishing sustainable trust relationships. Because the production of knowledge pro uh, yeah, produces in turn a greater awareness of ignorance, trust in the harmlessness of uncertainty may break down. This is, was the case, as I will explore later, when food regulators introduced amendments to food additives regulation, with assent which essentially withdraw this a priori trust. Finally, I will turn to a discussion of how new bodies of knowledge relied on a, a change the perspectives on food and food security. While early food regulators relied on a chemical paradigm, which understood food as a compound of chemicals, the life sciences, roughly 100 years later, established a new concept of food based on molecular biology and genetics. As we will see, the question here is no longer how to establish trust in food, but how to assess the risk of developing a disease in the future as a result of exposure to health damaging molecules in our food. Now let me turn to food laws as the first science-based science -based trust regime. In the, in the mid 19th century, complaints about food adulteration and consumer fraud began to make headlines in the press of industrialized nations. The range of new food products on the market stemming either from imports or from innovations of industrially processed food challenged the experience-based knowledge of not only consumers but also food merchants themselves to make judgments on food quality. A remarkable percentage of these product innovations and modifications were initially perceived as adulteration of food, causing heightened uncertainty at the food market. Because inadequate food supply can easily result in political unrest, national legislators sought to establish an infrastructure for food control by enforcing nationwide food laws that were to supersede local regulations. Great Britain pioneered this development. In 1860, the British Parliament enacted a landmark food law aimed at preventing the adulteration of all food and drink. The German Empire followed in 1879, and between 1890 and 18, uh, 1906, national food laws were enacted in Belgium, Austria, Switzerland, France, and the United States, and maybe elsewhere. These laws, however, provided merely a framework for food controls and had to be supplemented with the establishment of food standards that would serve as benchmark for verifying the quality of food. But who was to define these standards? Practitioners of the food business claimed to have the last word on how to secure food quality and food safety, yet for the most part showed limited interest in collaborating with experts such as chemists, hygienists or doctors. Chemists developed an even ever greater interest in food chemistry as the chemical analysis of food promised to become a rewarding field for exploiting their professional expertise. It is no surprise then that chemists pushed for the establishment of chemical analysis and use of the nutrients paradigm. It is understand, to understand food as a compound of nutrients to be analyzed by chemical analysis for determining food standards and in turn food quality. With the nutrients paradigm, food chemists could use quantifi the quantification tool as a technology of trust, as Ted Porter has called it, because numbers lend the appeal of objectivity to the established standards. National legislators were faced with the task of reconciling the interest of the food industry in liberal markets with consumers' demand for fo safe food and the state's interest in public health and political stability. As a result, food legislation at the turn of the 20th century varied from nation to nation, giving rise to slightly different systems of food control to guarantee food safety. 
At the same time, however, hygienists and chemists pushed for an international approach toward food regulation. In September of 1907, the Société Universelle de la Croix Planche de Genève was created as an international association based in Paris specifically in order to fight food fraud and adulteration. The association organized two congresses, then it petered out. In spite of its short life and the fact that its successor organization, the Codex Alimentarius, took nearly half a century to get on its feet, the association had a great impact on food safety regulation. It strengthened the authority of chemical expertise in the food market, since the association's organizers managed to reach agreement on a broad catalog of food definitions that provided the foundation of food evaluation based on chemical analysis. Thus, at the turn of the 20th century, trust in food was established through food regulation and subsequent food regulation based on food standards became established in intense collaboration of chemical experts and food industry rep representatives. The institutions established in the late 19th and early 20th century have continued to be the primary institutions dealing with food safety even as globalization of the food supply has raised many questions about food safety. Now let me talk how more science and technology challenged the science-based trust regime. With food standards and institutionalized food quality control, the science-based trust regime gained a foothold in national food legislation. But the accelerated pace of food product and process innovations posed new challenges to the question of how to verify the trustworthiness of new food products. It was the rapidly increasing use of food additives together with heightened health concerns resulting from new knowledge on cancer-causing or toxic substances that prompted food legislators in the US, Germany and elsewhere to modify existing trust regimes. The Food Additives Amendment of the 19, late 1950s codified procedures of approval that required food producers to prove the safety of new food additives prior to introduction to the market. Thus, legislators deemed all new additives to be unsafe, unless the producers had given evidence to the contrary. In doing so, they institutionalized distrust by, by not granting producers the benefit of the doubt in order to strengthen the trustworthiness of established industrialized food chains. This change from an a priori trust to one of distrust accompanied by the requirement of proof was to have a tremendous effect when against the backdrop of the Cold War, protagonists in many countries sought to develop food irradiation as a new food safety technology. In my studies on food irradiation, I narrate the story of how US, American and German, as well as international actors, sought to capitalize on developments in atomic science for the purpose of food preservation. The decision of food regulators to treat irradiation as a form of food additives prompted legislators to prohibit wholesale food irradiation and instead allow for the irradiation of specific food items provided that applicants could verify the harmlessness of the treatment. To this end, the proponents of national food irradiation programs supported by international institutions such as the Food and Agriculture Organization, the International Atomic Energy Agency that is still very active in the field of nuclear agriculture and food irradiation, and the World Health Organization developed the concept of wholesomeness and set up wholesomeness studies in order to develop Oh, this was too fast. Uh, and set up wholesomeness studies in order to develop appropriate data for verifying the safety of irradiated food. The concept of wholesomeness is significant as it indicates uh, a still more or less comprehensive approach to the problem of food safety. Irradiation proponents and their supporters defined wholesomeness as encompassing three different levels of safety, toxicological safety, nutritional safety, and microbiological safety. 
While this concept of safety clearly excludes the cultural dimension of food, it relies on an idea of food items as something whole that has to be wholesome. This changes when food scientists take up the molecularization paradigm, as we will see in a minute. So I skip a short part, and now we go to shifting perspectives from trust in food to the health risk of eating. In the late 20s and early 21st century, a new group of experts became concerned with the evaluation of food. The boom of the life sciences, in particular the extension of genome research, generated new knowledge about nutrition, changing our understanding of food. Genome research began to ask new questions about food when scientists developed an interest in food waste and their influence on the health risk of populations. New fields such as nutritional epigenetics emerged, making new arguments about the relationship between food and body. Nutritional epigenetics examines the influence of nutrients on the regulation of gene expressions and the likelihood of a person to develop certain diseases over the course of his or her life. The US American sociologist of science, Hannah Landegger, and I rely very much on her argumentation here, uh, argues that nutritional epigenetics gives rise to a biomedical culture in which metabolism is understood as the interface between food and the body. The epigenetic experimental system transformed food into a set of significant molecules with a certain measurable effect on gene expressions. Here, food is conceptualized as a vehicle of important health-determining molecules. This understanding of food is both the result and the driver of a universal molecularization of food in science and technology, as well as in the realm of consumption. In science and technology, nutritional epigenetics shares common ground with genetic engineering. Both fields of activity rest on what Landecker calls a molecular imagination. In debates on the effects on health of genetically modified food, both advocates and opponents focus on the molecular constitution of food and the effects of genetic modifications on digestion. Scientists in the field of nutritional epigenetics investigate the effects of significant molecules in food on heritable gene expressions in hopes of detecting the mechanism in the unknown etiology of many diseases. In both fields, nutritional epigenetics and genetic engineering, concerns about the health risk of what we eat are based on and in turn promote the molecular biological understanding of food. With regard to food consumption, the invention and marketing of functional food, that is food containing biologically active components such as antioxidants to reduce cell and DNA damage by blinding free binding free radicals further intensifies the molecular understanding of food. The molecular biological approach paved the way for an emerging new subdiscipline within food science, nutrigenomics. Sociologist Susan Bauer defines nutrigenomics as a techno-scientific fine-tuning of food and body. Nutrigenomics aims at developing individualized diets based on the idea that each person's metabolism works differently. Nutrigenomic research practices encompass a broad variety of experimental constellations in which researchers work in vitro, in vivo, and in silicio with cell cultures, animal model organisms, studies with voluntary probands and biobank projects. Their work with databanks is of central importance. Here, researchers develop personalized diets, but not in relation to the person per se, but rather by employing mathematically constructed biological systems that are used as quasi-organisms. A statistical profile created through a series of subgroup classifications forms the basis of optimizing individual dietary plans. Results of nutrigenomics research quickly left the laboratory and entered the marketplace as functional food and nutrigenetic tests. Such tests are advertised under the slogan, do not eat just anything because you are not just anybody. Just as a personalized medicine and for the same objective, namely, um, 
Individualized risk management, personalized food practices are based on the notion of food as a potential health risk. Now let me come to a conclusion. As we have seen throughout this paper, generating trust in food is a complex task. Traditional societies identify food through local communities and regional cuisines. Safe is what people have eaten together and what they know how to cook and prepare. Traditional food knowledge is experience-based knowledge and it exists as part of a cultural tradition. Scientific knowledge began to be employed for establishing trust in food when national governments introduced food legislation and set up food controls and food regulation. With this, food acquired a new meaning as food inspectors examined it as a compound of nutrients and employed chemical analysis in order to prove whether the food item under consideration conformed to a defined standard. Here, the state took responsibility for the safety of food and food consumers deemed approved food safe to eat as they trusted in the rightness of food standards and the diligence of food inspectors. When at the turn of the 21st century, the life sciences began to develop greater interest in the field of nutrition, this had remarkable consequences for both the concept of food and the meaning of uncertainty, which in turn hold implications for the conditions of trust. Now, molecular biologists conceptualized food as a vehicle of important health-determining molecules. The concern is no longer with the safety of food as such, but with the ability to predict the probability of developing a disease in the future. This implies a shift from relying on trust relations to engaging in risk assessment. When we trust, we consciously accept ignorance and uncertainty with the expectation that this will not produce negative consequences. But when we treat uncertainty as a risk, we switch from the mode of trust and good outcomes, in spite of uncertainty, to the calculation of uncertainty, producing figures that indicate the probability of damages in the event of bad outcomes. This shift from trust, trust to risk assessment also redistributes the responsibility for food safety from communities and the state to the individual. We as individuals must make informed choices about the food we eat in order to reduce the probability of contaminating our own bodies or those of our children and grandchildren with disease in the future. Because the information upon which we are to make the right choices is complex and contested. Take, for example, the European debate about the threat of chlorinated chicken from the US on the European market. I do not know whether you followed this uh, debate or whether it really happened in Norway and Germany. We had a big debate about the chlorinated chicken and our um, uh, Minister for Economic Affairs says, well, people should not be so concerned because their children are swimming all summer in chlorinated water. But anyway. Um, well, okay, um, many people have began to return to traditional trust regimes to make their food choices by bypassing industrialized food chains and relying on organic and local food. This new trend indicates the breakdown, breakdown of our faith in state authorities and the globalized marketplace to have our best interest at heart. Activists and the local movement seek to return uh, agency to the individual as the point of access to trust in making their own risk assessment through their choice of food provider with the paradigm of traditional trust regimes. Just what kind of balance will be struck in the end remains to be seen, but it is clear that our relationship to and understanding of food as a result of scientific developments and food analysis in recent decades has significantly changed the terms of, uh, of this struggle and the implication of the question, what shall we eat? <laughs>